<laughs> that was quite an introduction. Um, Make sure you use that micro so there's people they out there. They got one of the right. oldest people they could find who was still mobile uh, <laughs> to come and do this. My cane is in the car, and I have a handicap parking stick. It belongs to my husband, but periodically I use it. Um, anyway, it is a joy to be here. I volunteered, well, Roger talked me into this sometime, I don't even know when that was. And I thought about it, and I prayed about it. And I thought, well, that sounds like fun, because even though I was here for 31 years, there's a lot that I didn't know. Being a Delaware native, I have been reliving my childhood in all these crazy boxes of stuff that people saved for time capsules in no particular order. <laughs> without any kind of references written on, on the pictures. And I've been working with um, Pat Wilson. She's gonna speak a little bit later. She um, did a lot of jobs at Wilmington Christian, was the person who signed our checks, and, um, and has been a friend of mine, personal friend of mine for years. And we've had a wonderful time going through these boxes. We have had a few asthmatic attacks. Um, so write this down. If you are saving stuff for your children and the next generation, put them in plastic boxes. This cardboard grow everything. So there have been times when we've had to use inhalers and a few things like that to get by. But I want to talk to you about some things that I learned about the school that I honestly did not know. And so. Um, we start with that slide, and we're looking at 75 years. It cracks me up that I am the historical society. I'm hoping that some of you will come along and say, hey, I'm old, I'd like to join that group too. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's me. So we need our next slide. You know, I asked for a teenager to help me with this because I am not good with technology. And I got an email from Brenda that said, there's a lovely teenager that's going to be helping you tonight. Here we <laughs> We're going to start with the basics of how we got where we are. Um, Wilmington Christian is just part of a long history of private schools, in, particularly in Newcastle County. The earliest one was um, started by Friends by the Quaker Society, not at the location where Friends School is now, but that was founded in 1748. That is well before the Revolutionary War, so those Quakers have been around for quite a while. Um, a Catholic school was later founded in 1893, and that, in case you're curious, is Ursuline. Again, not at the location where they are. The majority of private schools, however, were founded in the 1930s and the late 1930s. All but three of them were religious schools, most were Catholic, um, and owned by the Roman Catholic Church, which dictated how they ran their school. Sorry, my voice is nervous for some reason. The remaining three schools were founded with private endowment, and I'm sure they're gonna come to your mind if you're from Delaware, um, with private money from Wilmington's most affluent citizens. They were very selective about who attended their school. By 1989, it was estimated that 19,000 students attended non-public schools in Newcastle County. And that was the equivalent to one out of every four enrolled in kindergarten through high school. And it was said to be the largest concentration of private schools in a metropolitan area outside of Boston. And that's from an article that appeared in Delaware Today in 1989. I was interviewed for that, and the um, writer said to me, what do you like about teaching at Wilmington Christian School? So I gave him a few answers. One of them, he said, well, what about the fact that it's Christian? I answered, I love it because I get to use my faith when I'm teaching English and we can talk about um, human behavior and how God looks at things. When the article came out, well, that part didn't make it. What made it was that the man had um, interviewed my, had come into my classroom and said, 
what an orderly classroom she runs. So I made a magazine, but not for, the, not for what I was hoping. Wilmington Christian School was the 10th private school founded in Wilmington. It was the first religious school that was not owned by a church or a specific denomination. And so if we have any claim to fame, and we have many, the, we are the first school where the parents owned the school and they didn't want to be under any specific church uh, dogma or doctrine. So we're going to do the next one. Setting the stage for WCS. This is where my childhood came into play. First of all, if you're not from Delaware, if you're not a Delaware native, you don't understand that in Delaware, we take a, a big long road and we change the name every mile or so. <laughs> so I live on one end of Veal Road, which then becomes Wilson, which then becomes Murphy, and then becomes 141. It gets very confusing. We have some of our history that is like that, and so there was some confusion. I love when the Lord is going to do something. He sets everything in motion. And there was a turmoil that was coming in the late 1930s. The Presbyterian Church, USA, was headquartered at um, First and Central Presbyterian Church, which is that big fancy church. It's a beautiful church. Um, and that was their headquarters, right? If you don't know where that is, they're across the street from the Hotel DuPont. And that was their Presbytery seat. I'm Baptist, so I don't know all the right terms, but fill in the blanks if I mess up. Um, and so four of the local Presbyterian pastors began to question whether the Presbyterian Church should be sending money to support organizations that had, had drifted away from their Christian background and were no longer Christian accepted name. That started a nationwide brouhaha and um, newspapers across the country picked up this struggle that was going on. And Wilmington had a heyday, they got on the map and reporters were coming to see what was going on and people were split. Did they want to leave the denomination? Did they not want to leave the denomination? The end result was that the Presbytery said, we are defrocking for pastors. You guys were the troublemakers. We don't need you. And so they defrocked them. And so one of those pastors was a man by the name of, in 1936, was a man by the name of Dr. Harold S. Laird. He had, at the time, had actually been the pastor of the First and Central Presbyterian Church. But he got kicked out, as did three of his compatriots. And so Dr. Laird found uh, an empty AME church down on 14th and DuPont Street. If you're not familiar with Wilmington, it's in that trolley square area. Um, and they were able to rent it. About 250 people went with him and started a congregation called the First Independent Presbyterian Church. This is a personal note, but my father was led to the Lord by Dr. Lair. I am part of that legacy. And my brother is a Presbyterian pastor. I'm a Baptist, but we don't, we still talk. <laughs> we have our differences, but we love each other. Um, at the same time, so while the Lord is stirring up the Presbyterians and getting them started at a new location, um, a seminary gets started in Wilmington, and that is Faith Theological Seminary, and it's going to open the following year. So we have the church getting started in 36. We have the seminary getting started in 37. The seminary doesn't have a location, so the church says, come, have your classes with us. So now at the site, and that is the original site there, and I think we own the house next to it. I'm pretty sure we did, because there are some references to uh, different classes held in different parts of a building. I remember going to Bible school at that church. 
I am 112 years old. <laughs> I remember going to Bible school there, and it would not have been big enough for a seminary and a school. Um, so I'm pretty sure that that was the manse next door, and we had classes in there. Like I said, Delaware likes to change names. So somewhere along the line, um, in the late 40s, early 50s, First Independent had a little squabble about something. Um, I only know this story my mother told me. So Dr. Lair and about 200 people from that congregation left and that they took the name First Independent Church with them. And this is where it, some of you Presbyterians get confused. This building then became known as Faith Presbyterian Church. So when people say WCF started at Faith Presbyterian, not quite, close, but not quite. So that's what happened. Um, a founder, uh, well, I'm going to talk about the seminary for a minute. The seminary had many notable graduates, including Francis Schaeffer. Other graduates went on to become presidents of notable seminaries across the United States. And one was actually the founder and first editor of the Christianity Today magazine. Um, WCS founder R. Laird Harris was a professor at the seminary until 1956. And here's a fun fact. I have fun facts in here. Here's a fun fact. Dr. Harris was chairman of the 15-member committee that translated the NIV. So we're talking about people who are very well educated, very committed to their faith. Um, they know what they want to do. And I think Wilmington Christian is the richer because of that. By 1940s, we have a growing uh, concern among Christian parents about some changes that are going on in their school systems. And um, the whole time I was reading all about this, I kept thinking, thank God they're in heaven because they'd be turning in their graves if they saw what education had become. In the 19th century, an American theologian named Charles Hodge, Hodge rather, had written that public schools were doing a good job of Christianity and that he didn't see any real reason to have a separate Christian school. By the early 1940s, members of the faith faculty and the first independent church personnel became increasingly concerned about the Christian education of their children. Parents and teachers were also voicing their concerns. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how this relates, except that we had already had in Tennessee the Scopes trial the evolution trial where now we weren't we were going to be able to teach evolution and so that got a lot of people thinking about well what are teachers teaching and do we agree with what they're teaching um, dr. G Douglas Young who was a seminary faculty member was a leader in an effort to start the Christian school in Wilmington he argued that a Christian education should touch every area of a student's life. Instruction in only church and Sunday school could not compare with hours spent in a school. He warned that Christian instruction was becoming almost impossible in the public schools. I, as I've been digging through the boxes and reading board minutes, and by the way, your secrets are safe with me. Um, <laughs> but you did take really good notes. Uh, I have been impressed by just the willingness of people to hold fast to what they believed in and just make sure that Wilmington Christian was traveling the path that they thought was best for them. And so here are the founders. This just blows my mind. Because on February 12th, 1946, the church, the uh, First Independent Church had announced for a couple of weeks, that, excuse me, that they were gonna hold a meeting of anybody interested in maybe starting a Christian school. Um, and they were gonna call it the Christian School Association. Following a season of prayer, there was a lot of notes about how long they just really prayed over this whole issue. And following a season of prayer, 
the Christian School Association of Wilmington, Delaware was formed. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. I listed the founders' names there. You will not know them. I know a couple. I want to point out um, the Dr. G. H. Seville. He is Francis Schaeffer's father-in-law, and he was my adopted grandfather. Um, Dr. and Mrs. G. D. Young down here uh, were missionaries who had come home from the field. I think they had been in China, and they were very prominent members of First Independent Church when I was growing up. So, I I really sound a lot older than I thought it was in years because I know these people. <laughs> um, I came across a quote that I just loved and it reminded me of the founders. It says, wise men plant trees knowing they may never sit under them. And I thought the foresight that these men and women, if you notice there are women on that list too, had to start something I wish they could come back and see what we've become. So they start, their meeting starts at eight, and I understand that's about the time board meetings start, seven-ish, eight-ish, and it went till midnight, which I believe is also when board meetings end, <laughs> right? Um, so they started that trend, so you, those of you on the board who are still meeting at the crack of dawn, you're, you're following their tradition. What amazes me is that by midnight of that very same night, they had come up with this plan. And so I want to share some of it with you. They had decided that yes, there definitely was a need for a Christian elementary school. And maybe in the future, they would, be, they would have a secondary school. This was their initial organizational plan. Wilmington Christian School would have high academic standards. Dave Thompson, beloved principal, first principal I work for, said often, if it's, there's no such thing as excellent Christian education. If it's not excellent, it can't be Christian. And I've always thought about that, and I, I found that from their first order. The Christian School Association of Wilmington, Delaware would own and operate the school. An elected board of directors from the association would be responsible for the actual day-to-day -day running of the school in cooperation with the principals and the faculty. They also had, they had other things, and I didn't write them down, that they purposed in their hearts that in matters of serious discipline that the board would back the teacher and the principal. And in 1949, the first little girl fourth grader got suspended. I don't know what her crime was. <laughs> the fourth grade was a little antsy that year because they even had to hire somebody to ride the school bus with them. <laughs> One of the things that I appreciated, um, I, I, they didn't name her in the minutes, so she's anonymous, so if it's one of you, we don't know. <laughs> but you can tell me later if you want to. Um, but one of the things that I read in the, in the minutes concerning this discipline thing was that the teacher, who was probably Miss Pusey at the time, or who, I'm not sure who it was, was mandated by the board that when that little girl came back after her one day suspension, that no other fourth grader was to make fun of her. They were not to question her. They were not to say, it serves you right. They had a whole list of things that they couldn't do. And one of the things I've always appreciated about Wilmington Christian is that when our kids have needed to be disciplined, and you don't know the real world if you think they haven't, but that when they needed serious discipline, it was not held to their charge for the rest of their school. It was like, we're done, you did it, we confessed it, we're over it. And I just have always appreciated that. Having taught in a public school, that was not always the case. So I wanted you to know that they started that right from the beginning. Association members, that would be all the parents and the board members, association members must be in agreement with the Westminster Confession of Faith and its catechisms. Everyone would need to sign a statement agreeing to that, and it was even written into anybody that got a contract, like a teacher, had to sign 
that they agreed with the Westminster Confession of Faith. When I was here, um, we always had devotions in the morning, faculty devotions, which were just wonderful times, but one day we noticed that it was only us Baptists who were bringing our Bibles, and the Presbyterians just strolled in and took a seat. And, <laughs> and um, so one day, somebody questioned them. It might have been me, I don't know. <laughs> somebody said, someone who shall remain nameless said, how come you Presbyterians don't bring your Bibles? To which they replied, we don't need to, we have it memorized. <laughs> there was a big discussion about whether or not to admit students whose parents were not Christian. And that was a very big debate. Some people of, these, of those founders wanted uh, non-Christian kids to be able to come from non-Christian families with the idea of having it be evangelistic. And um, after a whole lot of discussion, they decided that at least initially, there would have to be one parent who could um, speak to faith in Jesus Christ. And that is a tradition that we have still carried on. And I think it has made our school richer. And voting privileges cost you money, cost you $3 annual dues, and then you could vote. The first board of directors, uh, I think we might have skipped, there we go, thank you. First board of directors, Dr. R. Laird Harris was the elected president. He was the keynote speaker at our 40th anniversary uh, celebration, and it was just wonderful. I don't know if he's still living. I was trying to do math, he could be, but I'm not 100% sure. And a Mr. Robert Bruce, a Mr. John Christie, a Mr. Robert Prince, a Reverend John Sanderson and Dr. G. Douglas Young. You'll remember he's the one that encouraged <coughs> a Christian school to get started. I chose this picture of people rowing because if you're in a boat and you have oar and oar, you have to all be rowing in the same direction. And I just love the fact that even in these early years, they were all rowing in the same direction. We were, rowing, we were rowing children into the kingdom. And that hasn't stopped. First faculty was Mildred Pusey, and the second grade teacher was Sarah Dennison. In 1947, they added two more faculty members, Ann Krause and Lynn Gray Borden. Ann Krause helped drive the school bus. She was a seminary student, as was Sarah Dennison, and both Ann Krause and Sarah Dennison went to the mission field. So, six months, yeah, this, I thought next time. Six months after they have their meeting, they actually are ready to open the doors. I don't know this person, but I fell in love with this little tiny kid named Sonny Vandeveer. <laughs> Um, and he was a student in 1949, so he would have been in first grade then. This picture, not that picture, can we go back to Sunny? This picture, the girl in the end with her arms around the swing, was my childhood friend named Joyce Wiley, whose parents had just gotten off the boat from Ireland, and um, I grew up with her. And if you look at the bottom picture, that's the early playground. <laughs> and there are board minutes where they're so excited because somebody donated a volleyball. <laughs> <laughs> somebody else brought like something like a hula hoop, although that's not what it was called. And the board had to approve, could we accept this volleyball? <laughs> could we accept this hula hoop? So things were pretty lean if you were a little kid trying to play in that early in that early year. We did have a bus um, program, but we borrowed buses from churches. And, and then the seminary students drove them. Um, it turned out that one of my neighbor's father was one of the bus drivers. Then we get to Mildred Pusey, a legend. She is right out of the school norm dictionary. Even her picture looks like it. Uh, she never married, and she was little. She was small in stature. She was hired in 1946, and she continued teaching 33 years. 
Roger alluded to this fact that when you are hired by Wilmington Christian, you have a job, and then that job morphs into another job, and then you see a need and you take that job on, and before you know it, you're wearing about 10 different hats, and you're loving every minute of it. That's the part we don't talk about. Um, once Wilmington Christian gets in your heart, you're hooked, and, and I retired, but I left my heart here. Um, by 1964, Little Miss Pusey was principal, teacher, mentor, school nurse, occasional janitor, admissions committee, parent counselor, advisor to the board of directors, and this little woman attended every single meeting that was held. It's a good thing she was single because she had time to do that. One of the interesting things that I found about her, um, and Pat Wilson knows this firsthand, money was so tight. When I look at the board minutes, there are, there are years where they finish with $12 in the black. There are years when they finish totally in the red and somebody comes and helps them out. Um, but in the summer, Miss Pusey would donate her actual salary and she only started with about $1,800 was her first salary. But she would donate her salary to the teachers so that they could get paid in the summer. And so I'm sure when she got to heaven, there was a great big crown waiting for her. Uh, our Laird Harris said, no better salesperson for Christian education could be imagined. And Roy Wilson, who served on the board for over 20 years, he said, in a real sense, Miss Pusey was the glue that held WCS together. And when I first started here, she was long gone, but people who knew her kept saying, oh, I'm sorry you didn't get to know Miss Pusey. So <coughs> when we get to heaven, we're going to have to look her up. She'll be short, but she'll have a big <laughs> crown or unless she gave it to Jesus. <laughs> um, so by 47, we start with 32 students. By 1947, we're offering grades one through six. Transportation required the purchase of a bus, which would be driven by parents, seminary students, and this one teacher, Ann Krause, as I said. Scholarships were approved for members of First Independent Church, whose parents could not afford it. And the first scholarship was given to Paul Truax. I met him at a funeral, believe it or not, a few years ago. And he would say, I was the first student at Wilmington Christian School. I don't think technically he was, but he, I think what he meant was he was the first <coughs> scholarship student. And uh, Roger had the privilege of, of talking to him, and he was so excited. He loved Wilmington Christian School. Um, we were, I wanted to contact him, but unfortunately Jesus called him home. Or fortunately for him, Jesus called him home, so he's not with us. But what a legacy he had. First scholarship. From 1962, we're on the next one. Or we're back to Sunny. Okay, now we're here. 1962 to 1968. You have to keep in mind that Wilmington Christian, almost from year two, was always on the hunt for a location. I, I just completed a big study of Exodus, and I, not for the same reasons, but I see Wilmington Christian visually as just wandering from place to place. Who's big enough for us? Who will take us in? Who will, who, where can we afford to go? So in 62, the Chambers Mansion became available in <coughs> Belfont. It is still there today. It's on Laura, uh, Brandywine Boulevard and Laura Avenue. Um, it had been a private home. It was actually the home of Mr. Chambers, hence the name, who was uh, a leading DuPonter, and he is responsible for changing DuPont Company from a gunpowder dynamite plant to the dyes that they became most famous for. Um, and so this mansion was his, and uh, the school was able to buy it. I'm not sure what they paid for it. I find some numbers that vary, but it's in the 20s or the $30,000. And again, they didn't have money for that, so they had to raise it. They start there with 132 students. 
And they're so big that they can only have grades one through three at the mansion, and four through six is at Pres Faith Presbyterian Church, which by this time has relocated from downtown. Remember how I told you we had two names for that church? They had relocated to the property where they are now on Marsh Road in um, North Wilmington. So we have a split student body. Blessings and growing pains continue. In 67, we see the declining enrollment of some things were going on, um, and we just didn't have enough students, so we eliminate seventh and eighth grade. In 1968, fourth, fifth, and sixth grades have to move over to Faith Presbyterian as well, because the furnace at the Chambers Mansion has broken, and there's no money to repair it. So we um, now have everybody back at um, Faith, and the board says, we can't afford to fix it, let's put it on the market. I saw that it was on the market for $32,000. I don't know what it sold for, but imagine that. It's the price of some people's cars. In 68, the entire student body relocated to Emanuel Baptist Church on Green Hill Avenue. An additional grade was added each um, subsequent year, and the enrollment was now 484 people. In, 17, uh, 17, in 1979, the first graduating class of Wilmington Christian receives their diplomas. Fun fact, Carol Alston receives the very first WCS diploma. Where is Carol? Do you still have that? I still have it. Okay, we should, we should have that. <laughs> yearbook advisor for all of the thousands of years that I was here and it was all it's the yearbook is called the microcosm and year after year after year I had to answer the question why is there a book called the microcosm well we got a vocabulary Carol Austin Stiles had learned a vocabulary word was proud and stuck it on the yearbook and there it is <laughs> it actually means a little world within a bigger world um, the board purchased, this is where I think our history just gets <coughs> so cool. I, I have been impressed by so many things that I've read, but I've really been impressed by what happens next. Where we are, sitting today, tonight, was 14.6 acres known as the um, Shakespeare Farm. I always was happy I got to teach English at the Shakespeare farm. Um, but it was known as the Shakespeare farm. It had been a dairy farm. It had a very dilapidated barn on it. They grew corn. They had a huge apple orchard. And they were right off of Loveville Road. We, we bought that with the idea that when we get money, which they should have known was probably not going to happen, but when they got money, they were going to build. Okay. In the meantime, the elementary grades are, have all gone back to faith, but let's skip and go over. Here's what it looked like. You see this steeple way in the back? Excuse me. Way in the back? That is Berea Church. It was open all the way down to Berea. I find that fascinating. I don't know about you, but stay with me. They, we, they spent $140,000 for this little nowhere, nothing piece of property. When I was growing up, Hocassin was just sort of a wide path in a bunch of farms. Um, you just think about how the Lord gave us this property and what is it worth now? What would it be worth? Um, so it had apple orchards, they're, got, they're gonna build, and then they think, wait, we have a better idea. And again, God, God says, mm -mm, this is an if. And so they're trying to find my right thing. Um, the the um, desegregation had, uh, rulings had gone, had come into uh, fruition in the late 70s. And I was a public school teacher at that point, but what they did was they took Wilmington 
If you're not from Wilmington, you might not know this, or if you're younger, you might not know this. They divided Wilmington up into pie-shaped wedges, and the pie, the wedge, closest to the suburb is where they transferred all those kids. And so if you think about it, there is no public school, high school in Wilmington. I, there's only a couple of even elementary schools. But there's no public high school in Wilmington. That was by design. So what happened was what we call white flight. And people were pulling their kids out of schools. I, um, Archmere decided to go co-ed that year because they could pick up students. And so people were scrambling for where to put their children in school because they didn't like the desegregation rulings. Red Clay was sitting with 12 vacant school buildings and they were up for sale. And so Wilmington Christian put their plans to build on this property on hold and it made sense, there was already an existing building. The entire school could be housed there. And they put it on, um, they bid, and they actually bid even more than, the, than Red Clay was asking. And Red Clay said, no. We don't want a white flight school in our district. The newspapers picked up on it, 12,000 people signed petitions, that's more than we had at Wilmington Christian, so it wasn't just us. 12,000 people signed petitions. The newspapers, editorials, they were like, are you kidding me? Wilmington Christian has been around since 1946. We have always had an ethnically diverse student body right from the first year. I have pictures to prove it. And there was this public outcry. And Red Clay said, no way. So we had a wonderful lawyer. I hope you're not related to him, but I always thought of him as kind of a junkyard dog because he would go after what he needed to go after. Um, and he took it all the way to federal court. And I actually read some articles about the court case. And the judge, talk about, talk about how the Lord still moves people around. The judge said to Red Clay, you have no reason to deny this sale. You have not proven your case. But then he let them deny the sale. And so it was very crushing. We thought we had a solution to our overcrowding and being here, hither and yon with our people. What happened was, it was Jesus. And he said, this is the place this is the place, and I thought, when you go back to that slide of the cornfield, I thought, when the children of Israel wandered through the wilderness, and they got almost to the promised land, if I had been one of those people, first of all, I would have been grumbling like the rest of them, I would have said, are you kidding me? It's a cornfield. We have no money, it's a cornfield. I think when the board looked at it, and Pat Roy's hus past husband Roy was on the board at the time, and they actually held a prayer meeting in the broken down barn and decided that they would buy it, and later decided this is where we are, we will build on it. And I think if they had seen the vision of all of this, they would have built immediately. And it's just, it's such a beautiful story to me of um, how the Lord kept saying, no, that's not it. And we tried to buy another, we tried to buy the Hercules building, which wasn't even owned by Red Clay, but one woman from Red Clay got everybody up in arms. That was in the late 90s. And so Red Clay was like, oh, sorry, we can't, we can't sell to you. Um, we, we tried to buy a, um, a public school downtown Wilmington. That didn't work. We tried several different locations. They always fell through. And it's because Loveville Road was our promised land. It makes me very emotional, but I'm so thankful, so thankful for our boards who made those decisions. In, we don't actually start building until 1983. 
1984, um, we are going to merge, our upper school is going to merge with Temple Christian. And a fun fact is that Ralph Jarrell, where is Ralph? Here he is. Um, Ralph Jarrell, head of our math department now, was a sophomore who transferred from Pike Creek over to Wilmington Christian. We're so glad, glad that you did. Um, the merger brought 100 more students over to this campus, to the upper school. All right. And now we have elementary branches. Ruth, are you looking? Okay. If you know Kate Jones, uh, Kate Davis, rather, Kate Jones Davis, graduate of Wilmington Christian, this is her sixth grade. Is it say sixth grade? I can't read it. Um, anyway, our teacher in the elementary school, this is our little Katie up there, when the sixth grade moves over and the elementary comes back. And this is just a picture of them breaking ground. Um, Marilyn Stoll was uh, principal, Sandy Adler was the headmaster, and John Sylvester was on the board. I went, we're on our last slide, and you'll be thrilled. Um, <laughs> whoops, I skipped that one. This is where Bill Stevens plugs in. Um, Bill was headmaster in the 2000s. Um, we do a high school edition, because at one point we were all together sitting on each other's laps. Um, he, is, he is part of building our, um, our addition to the high school. That is actually a blueprint that year for the yearbook. I couldn't think of a cover, so we just photocopied the, uh, the actual blueprint. The edition is done in 2007. Oh, I wrote that in white ink, which doesn't exactly show up, does it? We, they finished that in 2007, and then where we are now, the Fine Arts Gallery was finished in 2008. Barbara Schiller and I, for about eight years together, did plays, and we used to pack up cars and travel all over to anybody that had an auditorium that would let us in. We performed in Sally's, and we even performed in the Brandywine Springs School that wouldn't sell to us. We went, <laughs> we went and performed there. Um, and when this was done, Barbara Schiller and I, we, we had a dream of bringing our theater program home. And Barbara and I stood on the stage and we cried like babies. We were so glad, so glad to be home. And now we have this wonderful facility. The last slide, as I said, so be excited. The last slide is just some random pictures of board <coughs> people. Um, Board members do not take photographs very often. I always found out when I was doing the, doing the yearbook, I'd be like, where's the board? Well, they hadn't had a picture. Probably because you work till midnight and who looks good at 12 o'clock. Um, so if you're a board member and you have a picture of the board, we'd love to have it. Uh, otherwise, we're just gonna guess who you are and what you look like. Um, <laughs> I did put Roy Wilson was the board president from 69 till 89, um, and that is Pat's husband, and also Brenda Kibler's grandfather-in-law. So we have a third or fourth generation um, with us tonight, and I'm so excited about that. And I say, we've only just begun. You can hear the Carpenter song playing in the background. <laughs> we have had 75 years of God's grace. We've had 75 years of, is this going to work? How are we going to pay for this? We have educated students from 22 foreign countries, in addition to our own American kids. Um, we have students who are serving in every area of life that you can think of. We have doctors. We don't have Indian chiefs. I was doing that the other day. Doctors, <laughs> lawyers, no Indian chiefs yet that I'm aware. We have diplomats. We have um, state senators. We have all kinds of people, all kinds of students who have grown up to follow Jesus in these various professions. I would like to thank you for your part in Wilmington Christian. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elle. And I'm going to introduce you to Pat.
Wilson, and um, Melanie is going to come and just ask her a couple questions from her long-term perspective on the school. But I have to really give a very thorough introduction to her. Because in 1964, Pat and her husband Roy were driving in down Brandywine Boulevard and just stopped out of curiosity because they saw a little sign that said Wilmington Christian School outside of the Chambers Mansion that we saw. Well, they both uh, decided right then and there to enroll their kids in the school. They both became volunteers. Their daughter, Cindy, attended through eighth grade and, of course, had to transfer to Mount Pleasant because we didn't have high school at that point. In May of 1966, and I can say before I was born, um, <laughs> Pat became the school secretary. And she made a whopping, I, I hope I'm okay to say this, $1.35 an hour. But key is that she was authorized to sign checks all the way up to 25 bucks <laughs> without any uh, board approval. Supervision. <laughs> uh, Roy offered to paint the Chambers Mansion during the summer if the school would buy the paint. So that was kind of like one of the first matching gifts. <laughs> but paint, uh, paint the building. In April of 66, Roy was appointed to the maintenance subcommittee. Sounds very important. But what that really means is he worked during the day at Sun Oil and then worked at WCS in the evening doing maintenance. So that's what it meant to be on the committee. In 1967, Pat asked the board for permission to form what she called the Mother's Club. The club raised money for additional school needs not in the budget. They bought a typewriter and a ditto machine. <laughs> they compiled and sold family recipe cookbooks as well as many other fundraising events. And Pat became the first president of the Mother's Club. In 1969, besides the fact that I was born then, Roy Wilson elected as the board to the board of directors and served for 20 years both as member and president. In 1980, Roy and Pat's son Kenneth graduated from WCS. In 1989, their son David died in a tragic accident in eighth grade. Pat joined William Carey in the business office sometime in the late 70s or 80s. And uh, did we get that date? For sure, what time you no, started in the... we don't know. Is, yeah. <laughs> Just pick a number. Right. <laughs> and uh, she stayed in that position until she retired in the year 2000, just as a uh, bill was coming. Pat's grandchildren, David and Chrissy Kibler, attended WCS. Pat's great-grandchildren are current students, Eva and Memphis Kibler. And Pat's granddaughter-in-law, Brenda, is a current employee at the school. So Brenda is actually following a legacy that started in 1964. That's pretty amazing. So four generations of the Wilson family have attended and served here at WCS. So we just thought it would be fun to have Mel just ask Pat a couple of questions. So come on up here, and uh, Mel is going to ask her a few questions here so we can get to know a little bit more firsthand what it was like back then. because it's been like the legend and folklore. When I first got here and they first told me I had to write checks, you know, I go through filing cabinets and papers and Pat Wilson, Pat Wilson, the names on the documents we had to get for, you know, bank things and it was always Pat Wilson. I think to myself, who is this Pat Wilson? Like Pat Wilson holds the keys to the history. All of those dusty documents in the filing cabinet upstairs, your name is all over. So as we go through the filing cabinets and all the documents, um, you know, to finally put a face to that name and be able to meet you over the last couple of months has just been a tremendous blessing. But well, this is the funny part. My name is actually Naomi, <laughs> and that's the way the checks were signed. Yeah. Right. Don't tell me that. It's probably not legal. <laughs> but my first question for you is why? So you made the choice as you're driving down the road. Lots of different options for schooling for your kids in this area. Driving down the road, and you see that sign kind of back behind the bushes. Uh, why? And not only did you send your kids here. But after having other responsibilities, your husband having a full-time job, 
the painting, the pouring in the sweat equity on the weekends, after hours, and then uh, I just can't imagine all of the work uh, after, you know, you're getting the kids to bed and homework, but why sending the kids here and then why did you just feel so led to pour your life into this school? Well, I think in the very beginning we came by um, uh, Lord Avenue and saw this little gray sign, red, red and gray sign that said Wilmington Christian School. We said, what's that? We had no idea what Christian education was. But our daughter was getting ready and had already been enrolled in Claymont um, for the school. And we went in. We said, let's go in, see what's, what it is. And we met our dear Miss Pusey, <laughs> precious lady. And we had we enrolled Cindy right then and there. She convinced us what Christian education was all about. And when we got involved in Wilmington Christian School, I think a willing heart, the Lord had sent us there, it wasn't by accident, uh, a willing heart to do what he wanted us to do. Mm -hmm. And so as the years went on, we did what the Lord uh, had need of here, whatever he wanted. <laughs> whatever there was to do, we just did it. And uh, so, I, but it's worth it. Christian education is worth it. I'm so glad the Lord led us uh, to this school to be involved in it. And that's why we had, we, it was a lot of sweat, it was a lot of tears. But you know, God is the one who had us at this place at this time mm -hmm. and moved along. And as I was thinking <clears throat> when Elle was talking about the rowing, all of the parents were involved. It was our school. We kept it clean. We, we kept everything going. And so the Lord has just get, really made it a blessing to me. And even to see this, uh, I've even had to have somebody to lead me around here because I can't even find myself. <laughs> and it's all so different. But God has been so faithful. And I wouldn't trade the years for nothing. My children are walking with the Lord. That is a blessing to me. And that's, that's the most important thing that will ever happen in your life. So that's why I love Wilmington Christian. I, we supported it. We, we've done everything that we could do to move it along. So it's the Lord, truly. Um, so what does it mean to you? Did you ever, did you ever think you were painting the building, you're acting as janitor, cleaning up the hallways, did you ever think you'd be here 75 years later? And then what does that mean to you, that we're here today after you enroll your young children, uh, you're doing all kinds of things on a volunteer basis, leading the mom's group, and then you're employed here. What does it mean to you uh, that we're still here after 75 years? I see the Lord's faithfulness. The Lord is so, so faithful. This is his school. It's not our school, but it's his school to teach our children. And I think that's the most important part, uh, being involved, uh, taking it, owning it yourself, owning it, being involved in it and working for it and just serving the Lord, whatever the need is. That's, that's what he's asked us to do. And so that would be mine, is be involved. Uh, I see so many faces here tonight that I have been involved with over the years. And what a joy it is to see how God has brought this school along all of these years. He's been one that's protected it. <clears throat> and to know that your children are getting a Christian education with God, uh, Christ being the center. And that to me is the most important thing is to stay on that track of the Lord, uh, God being, uh, Christ being the center of the school. So. Well, I think you are the epitome of ambassador. Everything you've done for as long as you did it. So as you see our current ambassadors, future ambassadors of the school that we have here, what advice or what suggestions would you have for them as the uh, future ambassadors for the next generation? How do they carry on with you started? Just keep working. Keep crying. Keep praying. Keep moving forward would be what I would uh, suggest. And uh, just God, if, when you're faithful, God is faithful. Mm -hmm. And God will move it along. And so my prayer is for Wilmington Christian School <clears throat> is that very thing, that God would continue to move the school along and uh, teaching and training our children in the way that they should go and leading them to himself. That's, that is the greatest thing. 
and I love Oral Christian, so <laughs> I would say, glad you're here, stay here, and stay with the plan, and just keep working for God, serving Him, whatever He wants you to do. Thank you.